So good night, uh, everyone. Uh, we are here for the, the second session, second conference of the uh, research seminar on nuclear issues. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Marino Ofan uh, today with us. Uh, he's, he's a PhD uh, at Harvard University. Uh, and now um, he's a, a post uh, post um, uh, sorry postdoctoral fellow postdoctoral <laughs> <laughs> fellow at John Hop Hopkins University, and we are, uh, he will talk about uh, nuclear proliferation in the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf, and all so, and the interconnection. Can you hear anything? Can you hear me? Okay. And the interconnection between um, energy and geopolitical, geopolitics in, in the region, and uh, most of all, uh, the, the concurrence uh, between the United States and France in the region during the 70s and the energy global uh, crisis. So, uh, again, it's a great pleasure, I think. It's, uh, I, I just read your, your article, reread your article. It's very interesting and I'm, I'm very uh, uh, happy to have you, you here to, to talk about your research, about your article on War on, on Rocks. So I give you fl uh, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had some trouble with hearing you. So I tell me if the connection is good if you can hear me well is it good yeah, yeah we 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 listen to okay, you yeah perfect. we hear you okay if by any chance you have trouble hearing me please let me know okay so thank you very much bon je peux dans une petite introduction en français merci beaucoup uh, de me recevoir le plaisir est, est vraiment le mien uh, uh, donc je suis marine enfant je suis franco dominicain et là je vous parle depuis la république dominicaine uh, Et euh, comme Douglas vient de dire, moi je viens de finir mon doctorat à Harvard en histoire internationale euh, et je viens de, bon, je ne viens pas de commencer, j'ai commencé en septembre mon postdoc à, à Johns Hopkins au Kissinger Center for Global Affairs euh, et là je vais vous faire une présentation sur ma thèse en général et avec un zoom sur les questions nucléaires. Euh, Donc, je vais partager mon écran et je passe à l'anglais jusqu'à ce que on fasse le Q&A. So là, vous pourrez voir la présentation, n'est-ce pas? Hello? Oui, oui. We see your presentation. Okay. Okay. okay, super. So yes, so thank you very much. So um, so I wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation on the 1970s energy crisis, uh, and uh, I was not never expecting to write about any nuclear affairs when I got into it. On the contrary, I always studied diplomacy uh, and economic history. Um, and I feel that often nuclear affairs is a field of its own that's a bit separate from the rest. Uh, that's how it is in history. Um, so I did not expect at all to find uh, these nuclear issues happening in the energy crisis. Um, but so, but however, we have these events that are often treated separately. So you have in 1973 the Arab-Israeli October War. Uh, in which Syria and Egypt invaded Israel. Um, and then uh, when the US resupplied militarily Israel, you had the response uh, by Arab countries of launching an embargo against uh, the United States, some of its allies, and cutting down on oil production. And OPEC used that as an opportunity to raise global oil prices, multiply them by four, leading to the uh, energy crisis of 73, 74. Um, and simultaneously then, uh, later in 74, uh, by June, you have the visit of the Shah uh, of Iran to France to meet with Giscard and sign a nuclear cooperation agreement. 
And then uh, by uh, September 1975, it's Saddam Hussein's turn to come to Paris and meet with um, uh, Jacques Chirac, who was prime minister then, uh, for another nuclear cooperation agreement. And these stories may be told separately. What I was very um, surprised and actually fascinated to find out was that these are very interrelated stories that have a lot to do with the transformation of the world order geopolitically and economically during the energy crisis. That is the focus of my uh, doctoral work and my uh, actual my current book project right now. Um, so I entered this by looking at energy, uh, specifically at energy markets. And you can see here that 1973 uh, is a moment of transformation. There is a, a turn uh, from the United States towards the Gulf uh, and for France too, actually. Uh, so before the United States had generally relied on the Americas for its oil imports. And then in 1973, uh, you have a grow, um, huge reliance on uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries. And it was very paradoxical to me because why would you switch to the Middle Eastern countries that just wage uh, economic warfare on you as a solution to the energy crisis? So that was the initial question that sparked my interest. And what I found out moving forward what was that this was not just this was a transformation of energy markets, of course, from cheap and plentiful oil under a protectionist U.S. oil policy that relied on the Americas to fears of oil scarcity under a liberalized regime in which the United States relied more and more on the Persian Gulf. But it was not just a question of energy markets. It was a global geopolitical realignment in which the US moved from its strategic focus on Cold War crisis in Europe, Latin America, Africa, and Asia to an increasing entanglement in the Persian Gulf. It was a transformation of a global economy um, that went from an era of fast growth under balanced budgets in the Bretton, under the Bretton Woods regime to our current regime of uh, floating currencies in an era of growing economic stagnation and debt crisis. And connected to all of this, there was also an issue, uh, a transformation of world order in terms of nuclear uh, proliferation. So you went from the establishment of the non-proliferation treaty um, in the late 1960s and um, uh, coming in place in 1970, and then the rising threat of nuclear proliferation in Iran and Iraq as the uh, decade moves forward. Uh, and these are the main dynamics that I not only studied, but interconnected throughout my, dissert my doctoral dissertation and, and my, my, my current book project. I carried out very international multilingual multi-archival research going through the archives of France and Canada and the UK and the US and Israel, uh, but also getting documents from uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Venezuela, uh, from international organizations, from the press, from different United States agencies, the World Bank, the IMF. So I tried to reach as far as I could um, in order to get this more global story. And I can say that it, it was only by taking this more global perspective that I think I was able to reach my conclusions on the interconnection of geopolitical, economic, and nuclear affairs coming together uh, during the first oil shock. Um, so my, my in my dissertation, I go in five chapters. So I first study uh, the previous oil regime uh, pre-1973 from a uh, U.S. perspective and its relations with Venezuela, Canada, and Saudi Arabia, and how the United States progressively shifts to the Persian Gulf. I'll tell you why in a second. Then I study the um, Arab oil weapon and the, um, the embargo itself with the Yom Kippur October War in 1973. Uh, I then switch to the OPEC price shock, so the fourfold price increase um, made by OPEC and its impact on the international economy. Uh, and it is then that I look at how these combination of geopolitical and economic crisis provides a moment, provided a moment of opportunity for Persian Gulf country, countries to go nuclear uh, in order to help countries like France address the economic and geopolitical problems raised by the um, oil crisis. And 
this is the main chapter that went into my Texas National Security Review piece uh, that um, Douglas was mentioning previously. Um, it's called, called Oil for Atoms. It's mostly the chapter with some parts from chapter three. And then what I look at into afterwards is what this new petrodollar economy looked like in terms of the restructuring of global finance and the West relationship with the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Um, so that's the dissertation. Um, uh, I think in order to give you the full context of the nuclear side, which is I think what you are most interested in, I have to come from the perspective in which I was approaching this, which is first getting you the background of what the energy crisis was about. And then we can look at the French response um, uh, and how that led to the Iranian and Iraqi nuclear programs and why. And then I'll tell you a bit more about the impact. So I'll start by the beginning. Um, so I think living in the United States, I always had the impression that given the very close relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia and the fact that the United States had been producing oil in Saudi Arabia and that since the 1930s and also in Kuwait, that the US had always been bringing oil from the Middle East to the United States. And I was very surprised to find out that after World War II, the policy of the United States was the opposite. So when uh, with the Marshall Plan and the remaking of the world after the Second World War, the United States uh, built uh, a hemispheric oil system that separated the Eastern Hemisphere from the Western Hemisphere. So Eastern Hemisphere sources of oil, so the Persian Gulf and North Africa, were mostly destined for the reconstruction of Western Europe and uh, for Japan, while Western hemisphere sources of oil, so um, the United States domestic production, Venezuelan and Canadian oil, those were destined for the United States and the Americas more generally. Uh, and the United States worked hard to keep these separate oil hemisphere um, throughout the 1950s and 60s. And in, the, in 1958 and 59, uh, the Eisenhower administration passed um, very protectionist oil measures to really keep Middle Eastern oil away from the United States. Um, so this came in handy actually, because in 1967 with the uh, Six day war between the Arab world and Israel. Arab countries tried to embargo the United States, but they could not because they did not really trade oil with the United States. But by the late 1960s, by 1969, uh, when Nixon takes over the American presidency, he was facing competing pressures on one, what to do with the system. So US oil production began to stagnate, and by 19, after 1970, it began to decline. Um, uh, so the system needed a change, uh, and there were basically two sides uh, asking the United States to take different measures. On the one hand, you had um, U.S. states like Texas and uh, defense institutions like the CIA and the Department of Defense uh, calling to preserve American oil protectionism. Uh, which was a position that the Canadian and Venezuelan governments also took uh, historically. And on the other hand, you had multinational oil corporations and the governments of the Ir Iran and Saudi Arabia pressuring for Nixon to open up the United States oil market to Middle Eastern oil. Um, so on the one hand, you had states like Texas, the Department of Defense and regional allies saying that oil was a question of national security. And because of the instability of the Middle East, then Middle Eastern oil had to be kept out of the United States at all costs. On the other hand, uh, you had um, a different position saying that oil was just a commodity, a global market like any other, um, and that it had to be freed from protectionism in order to um, lower prices through free trade. Um, and there were these competing um, assessments of what the US should do. And what Nixon came up with was trying to have a relative opening of the US market to the Eastern hemisphere, but keeping a system of hemispheric preference. So giving preference to Canada and Venezuela for access to uh, the American market, 
then opening it to non-Arab states like Iran or Indonesia and leaving Arab countries as a states of last resort. And again, after the 1967 Arab-Israeli war and the threats of an embargo that actually went all the way back to um, Gabat Mal Abdel Nasser in the Suez crisis in 1956, uh, there was a lot of strength to that position that the United States would be safer if it not, did not import oil from the Eastern Hemisphere. The problem was that this system did not work because of you, the U.S. relations with both Venezuela and Canada uh, going into crisis. So on the one hand, um, Venezuela had had a stagnant oil production throughout the 1960s, and while well, Saudi Arabia had a boom, uh, which was a lot of it due to capital flight from Venezuela to the Middle East. So the oil, multilateral oil, no, the multinational oil corporations were actually stopping their investment in Venezuela um, in order to invest in Saudi Arabia, but also in Libya and other Middle Eastern countries, which was presenting Venezuela with a crisis. Um, and so the Venezuelan president came to the United States to ask for a new hemispheric oil policy that would um, prioritize uh, Venezuela instead of the Middle East uh, for US oil imports. But this would have meant that the United States would have had to side with the Venezuelan government against what the US oil corporations saw as their economic interest that was producing oil in the Middle East. So that was a question. Should, the, should Nixon support the Venezuelan government against the corporations to protect the system of uh, hemispheric preference for the West? In Canada, there were similar problems. So, um, Canadian oil was produced in Alberta in the West, uh, and it flowed into the United States, not into Eastern Canada. And for uh, Canadian Prime Minister uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, this was a problem because uh, Canadian, the Canadian government also started thinking that uh, with the decline in U.S. oil production, there could be more risk to depending on uh, imports for, from the Middle East uh, for Eastern Canada. So Montreal, for example, imported oil from the Arab world. Um, while Albertan oil flowed to Ottawa and to Toronto, but not, uh, not to Quebec. So Canadian oil flowed into uh, the United States, but not into um, Quebec. Uh, so there was an issue for Pierre Elliott Trudeau, it was should there be a consolidation of the Canadian oil market um, before any move towards a consolidation of the United States. And this came at a moment in which in Canada, public opinion was shifting towards having more and more economic independence from the United States. Um, so for Trudeau, the problem was um, depending, was connecting Canada to the United States instead of connecting Canada to itself. Uh, and to Nixon's surprise, the Canadian government started having more and more economically nationalistic moves that put uh, the United States government and the Canadian government in tension with each other. And then came another question. So the United States had some oil production that, and it had some oil reserves that it could produce, but they were in Alaska. Um, and there was a problem of how to bring that oil to the United States. If the United States produced more oil in Alaska, for example, it would not have to depend on the Middle East for its oil. Um, but in order to do that, again, you had to bring, to use tankers from Alaska, so oil shipping tankers from Alaska uh, to the United States. And after the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969, there was a lot of environmental opposition to producing oil in Alaska and bringing it to the United States. So the United States started running out of options uh, and it saw itself as increasingly unable to raise its production um, and unable to uh, find a better partnership with Venezuela and with Canada, which left it with few options but to, but to turn to the Middle East. And finally, there was also a Cold War issue here. So the, the 
historically, if there was a, a breakdown of Arab oil production, the United States produced a lot of oil and could export its oil to Western Europe and to Japan. However, with American oil, uh, oil production collapsing I and mean, going uh, stagnating and then starting to fall, um, then there was a problem because the United States would no longer be able to provide oil to Europe in case of an Arab embargo, for example. So if there was no Arab oil, the Soviet Union said that it could fulfill the role that the United States could no longer do and offered its oil to, to Western Europe. Um, and for the United States, it was, uh, this became unacceptable in terms of national security. So something had to change. And that change came uh, with Saudi Arabia's secret diplomacy, which in 1972 and 1973 uh, started making the case for a new US-Saudi energy relationship. So the logic went like this. Saudi Arabia, the Saudi monarchy needed protection. Uh, from, in this case, it was mostly from uh, the communist bloc. Um, Saudi Arabia had a record of reliability, of being a reliable partner of the United States. It had the largest um, oil uh, reserve and was the largest oil exporter in the world. The United States was the largest oil consumer in the world. So there was no reason why, why the world's largest oil consumer could not import oil from the largest exporter. Uh, Saudi oil was cheaper than Venezuela's. And finally, the most important point uh, I found out through my research was that Saudi Arabia could reinvest all its profits uh, into the US economy. Um, and if the United States imported oil from Saudi Arabia uh, and then Saudi Arabia placed its revenue in the United States, there could be a new interdependence that would ease the um, uh, balance of payment and inflationary pressures that were very strong in the United States. Uh, with the end of Bretton Woods in 1971. So this was the case for a new US-Saudi energy relationship. Um, and finally, indeed, the Nixon administration abolished oil import restrictions in April 1973. And just six months later, in October 1973, it was embargoed by Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Arab world. Um, so, the United States made this shift that opened, that basically transformed the uh, political and economic geography of oil markets in early 1973. And this made the United States uh, vulnerable to the Arab oil weapon, as it was called. So by October 1973, Saudi Arabia launches the embargo. And by um, January, the United States is really feeling oil shortages. Um, in this sense, I see the first oil shock as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Multiple U.S. administrations saw that it was a potential risk. Um, by, but by early 1970, they really started running out of options and connecting themselves to the Persian Gulf uh, seemed like the potential best way forward. And then the crisis comes. So the Oil crisis, I separated into two separate but interrelated shocks. So you have a supply shock by the organization of Arab petroleum exporting countries and a price shock by, by OPEC, the organization of petroleum exporting countries. So to give you the quick chronology, so you, on, on October 6th, you have uh, Egypt and Syria jointly attacking Israel. Uh, about one week later, uh, there are a lot of fears that the Israeli army, the IDF, will collapse under pressure. So the United States delivers weapons to Israel. The Saudi government had warned, if you do this, we'll have no option but to launch an embargo against you. Um, by October 16th, there's a first OPEC price hike uh, that actually was pre-planned, um, so this had not much to do with the war, but the war presented a context that made it favorable to increase oil prices. By, Arab, by October 17th, there is an official Arab oil embargo against the United States and the Netherlands, which also took a pro-Israel position, and a decline in Arab oil production, which continued after Arab and Israel, Arab countries and Israel made a ceasefire. 
the, the embargo was expanded to Southern Africa um, by November. And in December 22nd in Tehran, OPEC decides that given all this oil scarcity, uh, there could be a new price hike and the oil price is doubled again for a cumulative four fold uh, price increase in oil prices. So this is the uh, general chronology. Um, basically, the world was eventually divided into embargoed and non-embargoed countries. Um, there's uh, the question of Southern Africa gets often forgotten. I think for me, that was actually also one of the most interesting parts uh, was finding out that uh, the Arab world tried to undermine apartheid uh, and the Rhodesian um, white minority regime and the Portuguese colonial empire uh, in order to get the support of the developing world uh, for its um, economic war on the West, on the United States and the West. Um, and this is the setup in which um, the, then the crisis of the subsequent crisis of nuclear proliferation in the Gulf would eventually emerge. So that's the background. How, what does you ask me? What does this have to do at all with 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 uh, nuclear questions? The nuclear questions are mostly connected uh, to the price component. So. Basically, once that once the price of oil is increased by four by OPEC, this signals the most unprecedented transfer of wealth in recorded history to that time internationally, um, in which OPEC countries had most of the world's trade surpluses and the rest of the world had trade deficits in 1974. Uh, and this came right at a time in which the International Monetary Fund was trying to come up with a new monetary system after the Bretton Woods system collapsed in 1971. Um, and the oil price shock changed everything. Uh, if the International Monetary Fund was trying to restabilize the international monetary system, these imbalances, uh, these trade imbalances, uh, made it Im impossible to return to what was before. The dollar was the currency in which uh, oil was traded. So suddenly uh, everybody wanted dollars in the world. Prices continued increasing because of the uh, oil price hike. There were fears of growing debt in oil consuming countries. Um, and this also came at a moment in which the International Monetary Fund was thinking of replacing the dollar by a new what they call paper gold, gold special drawing rights, a new unit that would be the center of the international monetary system. Um, so then the question came up, so what, how can you pay for all this oil? The IMF said, you know, we, we can do this. You know, oil, OPEC countries have all, all these surpluses, the rest of the world is, uh, is falling into deficits. Um, oil producing countries can save their money in the International Monetary Fund, and then the International Monetary Fund can, can give loans to the rest of the world, and the International Monetary Fund can, can handle this. But the United States said, not so fast. This is not the solution for, for, for this. So what happened is that by February 1974, uh, the United States has its position that is making increasingly clear. Um, so the only solution to the price hike was for prices to go down, for OPEC to just bring them back down. This was unacceptable and not sustainable, and countries should not try in any way to have any deals with OPEC. So one alternative was, um, you know, if you have a deficit uh, and OPEC countries have a surplus, if you trade with them, then you'll be, let's say you export something to them instead of uh, in exchange for the oil, then you'll be able to um, uh, rebalance your, uh, your your trade balance. For the for the French government, however, uh, the U.S. position did not work. So the French government said that you know the situation was unfortunate, but that the French government had most of the world had no leverage to force OPEC to bring prices down. For the French government, you had to avoid a confrontation with OPEC, not to confront OPEC. So the United States wanted to bring consuming countries together and clash with OPEC head on. 
the French government said that that would lead to a disaster. So for the French government, the best tool to redress trade balances and protect their currencies um, was um, through trade. So launching some new exports uh, into oil producing countries. So the United States and France clashed as to how to resolve uh, the, the, the energy crisis. Um, if for the United States, the answer was for consuming countries to unite around the United States and force OPEC to lower prices. For the French, the question was about, about economic survival and France would build new forms of partnerships with OPEC to adapt to the new world reality in which these countries have suddenly had a lot of political and economic power. Um, by February 1974, Kissinger invites the leaders of European countries and Japan to Washington to try to find a common solution to the energy crisis. And he proposes his plan for consumer country cooperation that included what he called a code of conduct for relations with OPEC. So uh, basically would stop uh, any efforts by European countries to launch exports into oil producing countries in exchange for the oil. But the French foreign uh, minister, Michel Jobert, opposed every point that Kissinger proposed. He saw this energy conference as a Trojan force of US world, for US world hegemony. He said that the United States had no business dictating to European countries how to handle their economies, said that the conference was illegitimate, and he rejected any infringement on French sovereignty that would limit the range of options that the French government could take. So basically most countries rally against the United States, but the French government decides to go it alone and try to find its own solution to the energy crisis. So initially, the French government was looking for some form of European solidarity. For example, uh, the United Kingdom and the Netherlands had found new oil and gas reserves in the Northern Sea, uh, which uh, French national oil company Erap um, had uh, helped to discover. So what the French thought initially was that um, these Northern Sea oil and gas could be shared by uh, could be shared with France by by uh, Scotland and the Netherlands. To their surprise, however, for the British this was British oil. For the Dutch this was Dutch gas. None of them uh, wanted to share um, hydrocarbons within the European Community, and the French economy continued finding itself with no options um, to face its energy crisis. So then they turned to Iran, and again, a group of European companies like Gaz de France, Full Gaz in Germany, and ENI had come together to develop new oil and gas fields in Iran. Um, and this could have been a moment for European solidarity until the French government found out that the government of Italy was trying to seize this opportunity um, to find a secret partnership with, uh, with the Iranian government to which the, the French government responded, this is unacceptable. Everybody in Europe seems to be betraying us right now. Uh, so the way to go will be for France to find its own partnership with Iran. And what form would that partnership take? Oh, yeah. C'est lui qui... Uh, we don't, we don't see. Okay. No? Okay. Is it back? Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Thank you. All back? Okay. Okay. So then France goes it alone uh, and it tries to find a solution. So the French foreign minister meets with the Shah in Zurich and the Shah gives him a proposal that he had not thought about. So at this point in time, the French government had unveiled the Plan Mesmer and found that and decided that nuclear energy would be the key for uh, French energy self-sufficiency. Uh, so there were some roadblocks to that. First, this was a switch from petroleum to uranium. 
And in this sense, it required having a new relationship with countries like uh, Niger and Gabon, uh, that would be the providers of these uh, nuclear power for France. But there need, the, the French government needed something in the short term, some oil that it could get. And here, the Shah told Giscard and he told Jobert that Iran could have a solution. So they started talking about an échange pétrole atom, an atom petroleum exchange, in which short-term oil purchases from Iran could fund long-term exports of French nuclear technology into Iran. So basically, the, the Iranian government wanted to master nuclear technologies. France had decided to go on this nuclear path. France needed oil. Iran had oil. Uh, so this could be the, a new framework uh, for uh, Franco-Iranian cooperation. And they would have a secret financial dimension. dimension. So Iranian oil surplus, uh, surpluses generated by these sales of petroleum could be placed in the Banque de France to finance French and Iranian nuclear development. Um, so these are, this is the framework that becomes the first bilateral deal that the French government carries out in the Persian Gulf that involves nuclear reactors as a means to get not just petroleum, but also dollars. Uh, um, and with these oil, it could address its energy crisis. And with these dollars, it could help address its economic crisis. And this trade could also help redress French, France's uh, trade imbalances. So, Despite all the countries saying that they would go, that they would have consumer solidarity with the United States, this is the this French model becomes the model that is uh, followed by mo much of the rest of the world in terms of how to deal with OPEC. And because France had already started this first nuclear deal with um, with Iran, other countries such as West Germany, but also India find that nuclear cooperation can also be a way to get uh, oil and petrodollars from, um, from the Gulf states. Um, so the, the, the French government find itself having increased, uh, especially from West Germany, but also from, um, uh, from India to some extent uh, for these oil for nuclear reactor deals. But Iran had become the success story. It becomes the model bilateral deal. And the French government decides that this is a way that in which uh, the, for example, the, the, the Commissaire à l'Energie Atomique can develop new relationships with oil states, such as Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, in order to continue exchanging oil for nuclear technologies. Um, this came despite Shah, comments by the Shah that he would not refuse nuclear weapons if other countries in the regions had them. It also came right at the same moment that uh, India makes its first nuclear explosion. Uh, but for the French government, uh, their position, they took the godless position on nuclear matters. And what they did was to let also Iran into um, Eurodi, that was the um, um, and Ukrainian, uh, uranium enrichment uh, uh, company will continue bringing uh, And I have to say that this was met with a lot of resistance with, from the American government. So uh, this is a memo from the Department of Defense in the United States in which the US government is becoming increasingly concerned about Iran's nuclear aspirations and France's role therein. And in the part I noted here, they said, for example, an aggressive successor to the Shah might consider nuclear weapons to be the final item needed to establish Iran's complete military dominance in the region. Sounds, uh, sounds familiar, and that, that is a document from 1974, right when uh, the Shah was signing his nuclear deal with uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. But this, is not deter, this does not deter uh, the French government, who then launched a charm offensive with the government of Saudi Arabia and offered nuclear assistance in exchange for a preferential oil treatment with the Saudi monarchy. And 
it is then that when Saddam Hussein, who had uh, signed a bilateral deal of agricultural cooperation with the French government, see that the governments of Iran and Saudi Arabia are actually getting nuclear technologies uh, um, for, for oil, or at least that's the plan with Saudi Arabia. Uh, he threatens to expel uh, the Compagnie Française de Pétrole from Iraq uh, if he's not given an unconventional reactor. And again, he's talking at this point in time about the need in the Arab world for an Arab nuclear bomb um, against, uh, you know, to protect the Arab world from Israel. So the United States grows increasingly frustrated. Uh, the U.S. government accuses the, uh, the uh, Giscard administration of acting irresponsibly, uh, of bringing non-proliferation treaty to a crucial juncture. That's uh, uh, the words used in the U.S. National Security Council. And the U United States manages to exert enough pressure to stop a French-Saudi nuclear deal from happening. Um, by promising an, a new uh, US-Saudi special relationship that would not make that necessary. Finally, I want to mention that these uh, concerns about the sales of nuclear reactors to the Iraqi government were also uh, shared even within uh, the French government. So this is a memo from the Delegé General à l'Energie, uh, name was Jean Blancard, uh, who mentioned uh, to the Minister of um, I think Industry, uh, I'll read it in French, en conclusion, to accept the demand of the Iraqi synonym to the monde arabe à terrain pas limité, mais un pas vers l'arme nucléaire, ce qui dans le cadre du traité de non-prolifération. C'est donc là une question politique. So the word concerns about the potential future of the um, nuclear programs, which then actually lead the French government uh, to try to provide to Iraq the, uh, as many uh, restraints uh, on its program with French supervision as possible. Um, and as we know, um, this is the same reactor of Oziraq that will get uh, bombed by, Iraq, by Israeli uh, warplanes in 1981 in Operation Opera. Um, so this is how uh, the oil crisis uh, led to the birth of the Iranian and Iraqi nuclear programs in, in the Persian Gulf. Um, and I'll quickly uh, take you to where the rest of the project goes to. Um, so if all these bilateral deals uh, are generating new leverage for our Western Europe, for Japan, and for developing countries like India in the Persian Gulf, the United States decides that it will also join, it will stop its multilateral efforts and try to find the deal to dwarf all deals. And that it does with Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia in the world at this time, the largest surpluses, great surpluses with its money, with Saudi Arabian oil, revenues for 1974, they were enough to purchase almost a fourth of all the U.S. bank-held federal securities uh, in the United States. So Saudi Arabia found itself with an unprecedented amount of financial power. And that leads uh, the, the United States to find its own bilateral deal, copying the model of the French, but it was not a nuclear deal, but a financial deal with Saudi Arabia. Um, which it actually used to prevent the rise of a Saudi Arabian nuclear program provided by the French government, in which there would be economic and security commissions established to coordinate um, U.S. and Saudi foreign policies in the Middle East and U.S.-Saudi economic relations. And it included a petrodollar recycling mechanism in which Saudi Arabia would place its money in the U.S. Treasury and in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, um, in order to finally build this uh, mutually beneficial relationship. So um, if, um, yeah, so there was the birth of a new international petrodollar economy in which Saudi Arabia play, receives money from uh, the United States um, for oil, and then it places that in the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank, and then through Wall Street, the, 
the United States uh, lends this money to the rest of the world, including to uh, Western Europe. And I will argue that Saudi Arabia played then a key role in having the alternative option of having the International Monetary Fund be the main uh, recycling platform for petrodollars. Uh, they chose the United States as its partner because it, it felt that this could be the opportunity uh, for that mutually beneficial deal, despite the embargo and the um, moments of crisis between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Um, again, this then connects with the debt crisis in the developing world in which uh, uh, external debt ratios multiplied by two. Uh, you have OPEC countries providing aid, but it's not enough uh, to stop uh, the debt crisis in Mexico by the early 1980s, uh, when the Iranian revolution launches the world into a second oil crisis. And uh, uh, all of these forces finally come together. The geopolitics, the destabilization of the Middle East um, uh, during the 1970s energy crisis, and the debt crisis of the developing world in this petrodollar economy. Um, I'll argue that this transformation uh, of the world in the 1970s still shaped our world today. So concerns about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction led the United States to intervene uh, and oust Saddam Hussein and then get the United States into a very long quagmire in Iraq. There is resistance to the, um, to the uh, let's say, neoliberal economic system across of Latin America uh, since these debt crisis of the 1980s. The US-Saudi partnership um, remains strong, and now that's becoming a new question mark. Uh, and finally, we have uh, still the Iranian nuclear program at the center of the world's international attention uh, that still demands, a, um, that also remains a question mark on where that will lead us. Uh, uh, so that's my presentation. I hope it was not too long. Um, sorry for the interruptions. I'm in my um, parents' home in Santo Domingo in Dominican Republic, so it's not my gen my usual fix. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Marino, for for this presentation. It was very very interesting to 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 discover how these these national uh, decisions have uh, impacted the the, re the the region and the the geopolitics in the Middle East uh, and have created uh, the the regions of the Iranian nuclear program and uh, all the the wars uh, we can we can think about the the Iraqi uh, nuclear program or the 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 risk of a nuclear bomb in, in Iraq during uh, Hussein uh, regime, so it's very very interesting, and uh, I have some questions, but I will I will let the, the audience go first. So the eh, eh, on peut pas on peut on peut parler en français si vous voulez. Okay. So is there any question in the room or in the chat? Est-ce que vous avez des questions en français ou, ou en anglais Si vous voulez vous entraîner, on organise ça pour ça. I, I, perhaps, j'ai peut-être une première question. Je ne sais pas si vous m'entendez. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien Oui, je vous entends très bien. Ouais. Très, bien. Ah, très bien. Je suis le, le, le professeur Zajek, je suis le directeur de cet institut et je voulais d'abord vous remercier vraiment énormément pour euh, avoir accepté d'intervenir dans ce séminaire qui essaie de, de permettre aux étudiants euh, qui ont des cours ici sur la politique et la doctrine, les, les doctrines nucléaires comparées dans le monde, eh d'approfondir un peu euh, ces cours en, en, voilà, dans le domaine de la recherche. Donc merci beaucoup. J'ai une, une première question peut-être pour vous. Euh, dans, la, dans la description générale que vous faites de la géopolitique finalement euh, euh, énergétique et en particulier pétrolière, du Moyen-Orient dans les années 70, euh, avec cette action de la France et cette action des, des États-Unis, est-ce euh, qu'il ne manque pas une dimension qui est celle du dialogue que vont avoir les États-Unis avec l'Iran dans les années 70, en particulier sous l'administration Ford 
C'est-à-dire, euh, vraiment, à, dans les dernières années euh, de pouvoir du chat en Iran, et euh, on, on a des discussions qui vont très loin dans le domaine nucléaire entre Washington et Téhéran, avec un personnage qui est là en permanence, euh, qui est Kissinger, euh, ouais. et, qui, et, qui, et qui représente, me semble-t-il, la continuité des discussions euh, avec l'Iran dans le domaine nucléaire. Donc il y a finalement, me semble-t-il, pas que la France qui est dans ce type de relation qui implique euh, le nucléaire, euh, alors même que le régime euh, du Shah reste le même, hein, il, est assez, il est assez dur, hein, c'est un régime sécuritaire assez dur, les États-Unis vont très loin à la fin des années 70. Comment est-ce que vous l'expliquez le, et comment vous, que le, vous le réintégrez dans ce euh, paysage global que vous nous avez euh, très bien décrit Merci beaucoup pour la question. En fait, j'aurais dû inclure ça ici. C'est dans mon article. Donc, euh, pour les États-Unis, je pense que dans, depuis leur perspective, ils voyaient des risques dans le programme nucléaire iranien. Euh, mais le programme nucléaire iranien euh, avait déjà démarré avec l'appui de la France et de l'Allemagne euh, occidentale euh, pour d'autres raisons. Donc, pour l'Allemagne occidentale, ils ont arrêter de construire des centrales nucléaires en Allemagne. Et donc, euh, la subsidiaire de Siemens, euh, Craftwork Union, euh, devait trouver un marché. Du coup, ils ont passé à l'exportation. Euh, pour les États-Unis, la pire situation aurait été de n'avoir aucune participation dans le programme nucléaire iranien. Euh, du, et et c'est pour cette raison qu'ils essaient de devenir le, partenaire, le, le premier partenaire nucléaire iranien, mais avec l'objectif de mettre des impositions sur le programme nucléaire iranien, euh, des restrictions euh, qui, que le chat même a beaucoup résisté parce que c'était des restrictions qui, étaient, qui, qui allaient au-delà du traité de non-prolifération. Non Et ces restrictions venaient ils ont des inquiétudes au sein du National Security Council euh, de la possibilité que le régime du chat ne perdure pas et les conséquences potentielles d'un régime successeur qui soit anti-américain. Euh, C'est très surprenant, à mon avis, que dans les années 74, 73, 75, on voit beaucoup de discussions au sein du National Security Council euh, sur les risques posés par un, un successeur du chat qui soit hostile, tandis qu'en 77-78, la plupart de, des organismes d'intelligence américains ne se sont pas aperçus, même qu'il y avait une révolution en cours potentiellement euh, euh, successful. Donc, euh, euh, mais c'est ça le raisonnement américain. Avec le programme nucléaire saoudien, ils prennent la logique inverse. Donc, ils se disent euh, que vu qu'il n'y avait pas encore d'accord franco-saoudien sur le plan euh, nucléaire, les Américains pouvaient devenir ce premier partenaire et promettre à l'Arabie saoudite des réacteurs éventuels qu'ils n'ont jamais donnés. Euh, donc, euh, euh, la promesse de réacteurs américains euh, est utilisée au sein de la famille royale saoudienne pour mettre euh, les partenaires de la France au sein de la famille royale de côté et donner une position dominante à, aux, partenaires de, disons, aux partisans des États-Unis à l'intérieur de la famille royale saoudienne. Um, et finalement, ce qu'ils disent, c'est qu'ils vont inclure euh, un programme nucléaire saoudien à l'intérieur de cette coopération technique et économique euh, des comités que Kissinger crée avec le roi Faisal euh, et qu'ils vont le, je sais, they will drown it, euh, au fil du temps euh, avec l'espoir que les Saoudiens éventuellement vont oublier euh, cette promesse d un, d un, de, de réacteur nucléaire. Euh, C'est un peu plus compliqué que ça parce que le Koweït aussi fait des demandes de la nucléaire aux États-Unis. Mais la doctrine américaine devient que s'il y a un programme nucléaire existant, bon, c'est mieux si les États-Unis participent. Et s'il y a des programmes nucléaires potentiels, alors euh, les États-Unis peuvent euh, 
agir pour qu'il ne, qu ne réussisse jamais à décoller. Merci beaucoup. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a des, des questions Oui. Euh, J'aurais une question également. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien Oui. Euh, vous avez dit que le partenariat potentiel entre la France et l'Irak à propos de, de développement d'installations nucléaires a été un échec. Cela étant, euh, au début de la guerre entre l'Iran et l'Irak, euh, l'aviation israélienne, il me semble, détruit les installations euh, nucléaires irakiennes. Euh, ce faisant, je... Je n'ai pas dit qu'il avait été un échec, j'ai dit que... Non. J'ai mal compris, peut-être. Les, les Français, ils ont construit le réacteur au Irak, simplement, ils ont géré le réacteur. Est-ce que vous pourriez répéter peut-être Désolé, j'ai... Oui, j'ai eu de mal à vous entendre. Je n'ai pas dit que le réacteur n'a jamais abouti. En fait, c'est le réacteur aux Irak. Simplement, le type de réacteur que les Irakiens avaient demandé initialement, c'était un réacteur à eau lourde euh, que les Français ne construisaient pas. <rire> en fait, c'est, je pense, la, le, le premier point qui a soulevé des doutes, même à l'intérieur du, du gouvernement français. Um, et ensuite, euh, il y a différents niveaux de discussion pour aboutir, aboutir au réacteur aux Irak, euh, qui avait des risques de prolifération. Euh, et c'est pour ça, à la fin, que les Français utilisent le, 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 le nuclear fuel, le, le caramel. Donc, je dis le. Euh, c'est un. un c'est un type d'uranium euh, avec euh, une, euh, un, un bas niveau d'enrichissement qui pourrait être utilisé dans le réacteur. Euh, du coup, le réacteur, il... Il, il est créé et il, il existe jusqu'au moment. Euh, ce n'est pas la, le réacteur initial qui avait été demandé par Saddam Hussein euh, qui est construit. Euh, est, il, y a, il y a un long processus avec de la pression des États-Unis pour trouver un réacteur qui est de moins en moins de risque de, de prolifération. Et euh, dans l'accord franco-irakien, il y a un point de supervision française du réacteur euh, dans tous les moments. En fait. Donc, du coup, il devait toujours y avoir des techniciens français. Euh, avec la guerre de l'Iran et l'Irak, les, les superviseurs français sont évacués et, et ça c'est une des raisons qui euh, provoque des doutes au sein du gouvernement israélien euh, où, disons, la supervision occidentale euh, s'est terminée et le, le gouvernement israélien décide de bombarder le réacteur. Donc, ce n'est pas qu'il n'y a pas eu de réacteur en Irak. En Arabie Saoudite, <rire> c'est l'endroit où les Français n'ont pas pu construire le réacteur. D'accord, merci beaucoup. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Oui. J'aurai une, une deuxième question, si vous le permettez. Je, je trouve très intéressant dans votre, dans votre présentation le rappel en fait, des, euh, des articulations chronologiques. Et il me semble que pour comprendre en fait, toute cette histoire, il est intéressant de rappeler un certain nombre de... Je sais pas, est-ce que vous nous entendez Oui vous nous entendez à nouveau Je n'ai pourrais... rien entendu, maintenant je vous entends. Oui. Très bien, alors je, je reprends. Euh, je, je disais que dans votre présentation, ce qui était très très intéressant, c'était les articulations chronologiques, le rappel euh, d'un certain nombre de dates importantes que parfois on, on ne rappelle pas assez. Euh, il me semble, mais euh, c'est une question, il faut, il faut euh, se rappeler qu'à ce moment-là, la France n'a pas, pas signé le traité de non-prolifération. Elle ne le fera que très tard, en 1992, me semble-t-il. Et donc, elle, elle n'est pas tenue par un certain nombre d'engagements, de, même si euh, Giscard euh, va, euh, va représenter, finalement, avec Carter, euh, euh, aux États-Unis et d'autres, euh, une volonté d'améliorer de, 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 l'image de la France, euh, qu'elle ne soit pas considérée comme un proliférateur irresponsable. Euh, donc, euh, y, y, je ne sais pas si, si vous êtes d'accord, mais... C est, c est, c est, 
quelle est la dimension finalement de cette non-signature du, du traité de non-prolifération par la France Quel est l'effet, quel est l'impact de cette non-signature sur la, la politique de la France C'est ma première question. Et la deuxième question, c'est la question israélienne. Voilà. Euh, on a été coupé, me semble-t-il. Est-ce que vous nous entendez à nouveau, M. Offan Oui, mais j'ai tout entendu. Oui, j'ai tout entendu. Euh, je me suis arrêté dans la question israélienne. Très bien. Voilà, j'avais juste... Euh, la, la deuxième question, c'était euh, celle du rôle d'Israël. En 1973, il me semble que pendant la guerre du Kippour, Israël invite l'état-major iranien à participer à une observation de la guerre du Kippour aux côtés des Israéliens. C'est-à-dire qu'à ce moment-là, euh, les Iraniens sont de grands alliés des Israéliens et d'ailleurs euh, du, du monde occidental. Euh, que, quelle était la vision d'Israël dans ces années stratégiques que vous décrivez, euh, ces années 70, avant la Révolution Est-ce que Israël mmh. considérait vraiment qu'un Iran nucléaire était euh, impensable Qu'il fallait s'opposer par tous les moyens à un Iran nucléaire Ou est-ce qu'on pourrait considérer même si c'est difficilement imaginable aujourd'hui, on pourrait considérer qu'Israël, en fait, n'était pas complètement opposé à l'horizon d'un Iran nucléaire. Peut-être que ma question est un peu... Euh, n'est pas très orthodoxe, mais j'aimerais avoir votre avis sur cette euh, dimension. Oui, donc... Euh, vous pouvez répéter rapidement la première question, parce que quand ça s'est coupé, oui. j'ai raté un morceau. La, question, la première question était celle de la non-signature par la France du traité de non-prolifération ouais. dans les années 70. Quel est l'impact, ouais. euh, euh, à votre avis, euh, sur les décisions françaises Est-ce que, euh, est que ça a joué un rôle Est-ce que les Français se sentaient euh, lib libres, en fait, vraiment de leur mouvement par rapport au TNP Et la deuxième question, donc, quelle était la question israélienne D'accord. Ça, ça, ça se coupe à nouveau. Vous m'entendez oui. D'accord. OK. Du coup, pour la question de, de la non-signature, l'Allemagne occidentale n'était pas non plus signataire du traité de non-prolifération nucléaire. Donc, c'était vu par les États-Unis pas seulement comme une question de la France, mais une question de l'Europe occidentale. Euh, pour les États-Unis, c'était très préoccupant euh, la position française était qu'elle était capable d'assurer la non-prolifération d'une façon bilatérale. Ce, je pense que la... Euh, C'est la création du nuclear nucléaire group. Euh, le groupe des fournisseurs nucléaires euh, en 1974. Et pour l'administration... Ford, euh, le Nuclear Supplier Group était vu comme une façon euh, d'assurer que les pays qui avaient la capacité d'être des proliférateurs puissent euh, fournir des programmes nucléaires d'une façon, euh, disons, responsable avec de l'input américain. Euh, de ce point de vue-là, je pense que c'est cette non-signature du traité de non-prolifération par la France et par l'Allemagne occidentale avec euh, l'explosion indienne et avec le programme nucléaire iranien euh, qui donne l'idée aux États-Unis de Oui, oui, tout, oui, on vous entend à nouveau. Okay. Ensuite, pour la partie israélienne, honnêtement, je, je ne saurais pas dire, je ne sais pas si c'est de l'information qui sera accessible. Euh, c'est vrai que l'Iran et Israël étaient les meilleurs alliés à l'époque. Euh, euh, je ne peux faire que de la spéculation. Je ne je n'ai aucune évidence qu'ils aient été contre. <rire> euh, euh, 
En fait, ça ne ressort non plus dans aucune des discussions. Et pour les Américains aussi, quand ils discutent les risques d'un programme iranien, ils ne parlent jamais d'Israël dans les documents que j'ai pu voir. Donc, euh, il n'y a aucune mention euh, d'une potentielle opposition de part des alliés américains euh, dans la région. Euh, je... Par conséquent, euh, c'est spéculatif. Euh, les Iraniens, par exemple, ont été euh, clés euh, dans la pour donner appui à beaucoup de régimes qui ont, qui ont été visés par les pays arabes dans le premier choc pétrolier, par exemple l'Afrique du Sud. Euh, du coup, le, le, le régime du Shah, il jouait un rôle anti-arabe, même dans l'embargo. <rire> Euh, c'est contradictoire. La, la, la position du chat est contradictoire parce que d'un point de vue, il se positionne comme l'ami de l'Occident. Euh, donc, euh, d'un côté, il y a les Arabes qui font leur embargo, euh, qui font la guerre économique à l'Occident. Et le chat, il répète beaucoup euh, aux Occidentaux que lui, il est l'ami, de, qu'il est leur ami et leur allié, pas comme l'Arabie saoudite, par exemple. D'un autre point de vue, cependant, c'est le chat d'Iran qui pousse vers la montée, la montée des prix de pétrole en 1973. En oh, euh, et c'est, les, c'est la question du prix du pétrole qui fait les plus grands dégâts dans les économies occidentales lors de la crise énergétique. Euh, et ça crée une certaine ambivalence au sein de la où il ne savent pas comment dire vraiment qui se dit le meilleur ami de l'Occident, en même temps qu'il fait la guerre économique à l'Occident avec la question du prix du pétrole. Euh, du coup, ce que je trouve dans les sources américaines est un certain malaise. Euh, je ne sais pas comment ça serait perçu par, par le gouvernement israélien, tout en sachant que je pense que l'Iranien, l'Iran était aussi C'est le premier fournisseur de pétrole pour Israël en ce moment aussi. Euh, donc, euh, c'est une bonne question pour, pour de la future recherche. Très ah bien. Merci beaucoup de, de votre réponse. Alors, en vous entendant, je pensais aussi euh, au rôle d'Israël dans la fourniture de euh, technologies nucléaires à l'Afrique du Sud, ce qui permet de, de fermer la triangulation euh, et de rajouter ça, si vous voulez, euh, aux relations entre l'Iran et l'Afrique du Sud du point de vue... Euh, point de vue énergétique. Donc, merci beaucoup de, de votre réponse, euh, Monsieur Offan. Est-ce que vous avez des questions J'ai une question, c'est bon. Oui. Est-ce que je peux recevoir un peu bon. Vous m'entendez bien Oui. Euh... Ma question, c'est que depuis le, le début de la guerre en, en Ukraine, on voit de plus en plus de pays du, en développement, entre guillemets, euh, qui, sont, qui, qui veulent acquérir le, de l'énergie euh, nucléaire, de, de développer un vrai programme de nucléaire. Et euh, comment vous analysez euh, cette situation Et euh, est-ce que vous trouvez des, des parallèles, par exemple, avec les années euh, 60, 70, où euh, tout cette... Euh, ces problématiques énergétiques aussi, étaient aussi dans, dans, le, dans le paysage international. Ouais, ouais, très bonne question. Disons, ce que je vois dans les années 70, euh, qui est différent d'aujourd'hui, c'est que c'est les pays... Pétro- les, c'est les pays pétroliers qui sentent qu'ils ont le pouvoir monétaire pour acquérir de vrais programmes nucléaires. Euh, ce ne sont pas nécessaires. Il y a des pays en voie de développement qui réussissent aussi à lancer leurs programmes nucléaires. Donc, il y a le Brésil, il y a le Pakistan, l'Afrique du 
food. Uh, Euh, pour pouvoir le faire, tandis que les pays en voie de développement sont dans une crise croissante de la dette et le coût, le, le coût des programmes nucléaires était perçu pour, pour la plupart des pays comme euh, pro prohibissant. Quoi. Euh, ça impossibilité de cette transition. Euh, dans la crise énergétique, on déjà de la technologie nucléaire. Euh, ce qu'ils finissent par faire, c'est de brûler beaucoup, beaucoup de charbon euh, parce que c'est bon, <rire> c'est beaucoup moins cher. Euh, du coup, la, les questions économiques des années 70 ont fait que euh, le développement de, de programmes nucléaires était perçu comme euh, un passage pour des pays de l'OPEP au monde développé. <rire> euh, pour les pays euh, en voie de développement qui n'avait pas du, du pétrole, euh, la plus grande urgence était de trouver une source énergétique bon marché euh, et la plupart du monde a fini par brûler plus de charbon qu'avant euh, euh, que, qu 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 aucun point depuis la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Euh, pour aujourd'hui, je pense que bon, il y a beaucoup de questions qui se posaient dans les années 70 par rapport à la sûreté à des programmes nucléaires dans des pays en voie de développement. Je pense que ces questions se posent toujours. Euh, je ne, mais je ne serais, je ne saurais pas quoi répondre par rapport à une opération. D'un côté, euh, je suis très content, mais, quand, mais, mais pour des pays qui ont les capacités, disons, le, le système, les systèmes régulatoires en place pour pouvoir gérer cette énergie euh, avec un minimum de risque. Je me pose toujours beaucoup de questions. Donc, pour un pays comme, pour des pays européens avec des institutions très fortes, euh, je pense qu'un retour du nucléaire avec la guerre, de, la guerre de la Russie en Ukraine, ça peut être une bonne perspective. Mais pour les pays en voie de développement, je pense que comme dans les années 70, il, ça se peut qu'il y ait beaucoup d'imprévus et de risques euh, de long terme. Ils ont, ils ont mal de leçon des années 70 et qu'il y, y a eu beaucoup, beaucoup d'imprévus de, de long terme qui ont généré des crises, qui ont perduré. Euh, et qu'il y a eu cette petite fenêtre qui a permis à beaucoup de pays d'acquérir des technologies nucléaires que peut-être ils auraient acquis sans la crise énergétique. Ça, je ne sais pas le dire. Je ne veux pas dire que c'est la seule fondation. Mais ce contexte était très propice. Euh, et les conséquences, elles ont été très longues. Euh, je pense qu'il faut faire beaucoup attention aujourd'hui à que des situations similaires ne se répètent pas ailleurs. D'accord. Merci beaucoup pour euh, votre réponse. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions euh, je... Je pense donc qu'on qu peut finir cette conférence, cette deuxième séance. Je vous remercie, M. Auffan, pour votre participation et votre présentation. C'était vraiment intéressant. Et, euh, et j'espère pouvoir lire d'autres, les prochains articles de vous. Ça peut être très, très intéressant. Merci beaucoup. Merci, à, merci beaucoup à vous de me recevoir. Euh, et à une prochaine, j'espère qu'on restera en contact et qu'un jour, je vous rendrai visite en personne à Lyon. Ça serait magnifique. <rire> <rire>